Welcome back to Experts Only. I'm your host, John Powers. I'm the co-founder of Clean Capital and served as President Obama's Chief Sustainability Officer. On this podcast, we explore solutions to climate change by talking to industry leaders about the intersection of energy, innovation, and finance. You can get more episodes at cleancapital.com. Welcome back to Experts Only. Today, we talk with Jan Vrenz, who is a segment leader and partner for energy and sustainability and infrastructure at GuideHouse. For those that aren't aware of GuideHouse, it is a really amazing company helping to guide both companies and, and governments in the decarbonization journey. You know, what is interesting is a lot of companies struggle because they don't have the, the core um, the core resources or expertise really to understand these shifting markets around sustainability and climate change. And GuideHouse has the expertise to help walk them through. We'll talk about some of their most recent reports and, and some of the work they're doing and really highlight, I think, where things are moving uh, in this market overall. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. And as always, you can get more episodes at cleancapital.com. Jan, thanks so much for joining us here at Experts Only. Thanks, John. Happy to, uh, to be on here. Yeah, really excited to be uh, talking to you. The, wor- the work you're doing at GuideHouse is, is pretty tremendous, but I want to sort of step back and talk about uh, your, your personal career. You, you grew up in the Netherlands, came here to the U.S., and really built a career on the consulting side, working really for some of the most distinguished firms in the, com- the, the country. You know, what got you interested in consulting? And, and as you've gotten into it and had a career in it, you know, what have you learned about helping to really navigate and really change the direction of some pretty major companies with that? With those tools yeah sure um and, and i have to go back 30 years ago uh, believe it or not time flies when you're having fun uh, uh, john but um actually during my last year in college um uh, and i was studying uh, business and technology um i did an internship uh, at, uh, at kpmg consulting in the netherlands mm. and i wrote my uh, graduation thesis on technology driven business transformation and how uh, uh, important is for organizations um, as they implement technology to look at processes and to look at people and to look at you know structures and operating models to right. lead to lead to successful implementation. That's that's really how I got into consulting because after uh, I graduated, um, they they made me an offer to come and join them, and that's where I, where I joined KPMG as a consultant. And um, one of my first um, uh, projects I remember really well was an ERP implementation for a government agency in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, at that time, ERPs were not really integrated uh, yet. So you had you know, finance and you had supply chain and you had H- HR. And there was a yeah. lot of you know, technology integration or you know, system integration that had to happen to make it work. But, but my focus was really more on, on the processes and how the business processes and the organization and the people you know, had, to, had to be transformed as part of these, these ERP implementation as well. So, so that was you know, my first project there. And then at that same time, you know, uh, uh, we we developed, and I was teaching a, a, a course uh, on this same topic. So, you know, there I was, right, twenty five years old, um, uh, teaching on, you know, IT and business um, right. uh, integration to you know senior executives. So I can tell you, um, uh, not easy, but I learned a lot uh, by uh, by doing that. And then, where in that journey did you first start to get interested in in climate and energy? Yeah, so. Um, uh, after my career in, in the Netherlands, um, I actually made a couple of steps before I got to the US, John. So KPMG asked me if I wanted to help build a consulting practice in the Caribbean. I was, you know, 25, yeah. um, you know, uh, single. Sounds awesome and, when you're 25. Yeah. <laughs> they, gave, they, gave me an, they gave me an expat contract, which, which still existed at that time. So I said, sure. And, and the plan was to go for four years, um, help KPMG build out a, a, a practice in, uh, in, in the Caribbean. Um, that's where I met my wife, by the way, and I never made it back to the Netherlands. Um, right. after, after the Caribbean, I um, they asked me to uh, to lead the uh, energy practice for South America, and I moved to Brazil, actually. So I lived in Brazil, oh, and that's where I really got into energy. Uh, obviously, Brazil is a very, uh, not only beautiful country with beautiful people, but also a very rich country from, uh, from energy uh, for resources, sure, yeah. resources perspective. And that's where I started to see, you know, on one side, you know, the tremendous resources and, and, and opportunities of energy, but also the downside, right? With, you know, the rainforest being impacted by, by, by you know, deforestation and, and, and things like that. So, so that's where I started to think and, and, and get really, uh, uh, you know, interested in, okay, 
energy is is really key um, uh, to everything we do, right? You, you, we can't even have this conversation without 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 energy or electricity. But it's also, you know, uh, impacting, you know, uh, the earth that we live on. So that's where really I started to think about about those things. And then then I did move to the U.S. Uh, also for KPMG um, and uh, spent some time with Accenture. And then when I joined Navigant, that's where I really got into, you know, deep climate uh, sustainability. Uh, we uh, we acquired a company in Europe called Ecofish because I wanted to have a global footprint and I wanted to bring that climate. Um, right. and sustainability uh, 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 footprint uh, with it as well, and that's that's how I got um, you know into uh, into uh, into this space, and then and then Navigant became guide, Guidehouse later on. Yeah, let's talk about the path for a second for folks that aren't familiar, because I think people you know are getting to know the Guidehouse brand, but it came from from Navigant. Can you talk about you know the, the just infrastructure for a second, where you guys went from Navigant into PwC, and sort of how how Guidehouse was created? Yeah, so so Guidehouse was created um, from uh, um, the, the consulting, the federal government, the, the government consulting practice from PwC. Navigant, we had a long-standing history, and I, I will I will not go into that. Uh, but we were two standalone organizations, Guidehouse and Navigant, pretty much the same size. And then two years ago, we we came together. Um, we were acquired by um, uh, by, by Veritas Capital, who owns uh, Guidehouse, and we 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 continued as Guidehouse, where. Again, uh, Guidehouse XPWC brought this really strong government, federal, state, and local uh, expertise around large programs um, uh, that are so key uh, to, to drive some of uh, these policies uh, um, and, and make them work. And then at Navigant, we had really deep industry expertise uh, in, in healthcare, financial services, and then in my case, energy. Um, and, and bringing those two together, um, uh, we've created this you know, 21st century you know, consulting firm where I think what makes us really unique is that we, we can straddle between, you know, government at all levels and, and commercial and to, to take on yeah. some of the, the world's biggest issues. Um, and and that's, our, that's our ambition. Um, you, you need to be able to work for, you know, for the Department of Energy and at the same time work for utilities around how we decarbonize buildings, as an example. And I think that's what makes us really unique. We don't work in silos. Uh, these problems are too big. They cannot be solved in, in silos. And, and, and you have to have, you know, collaboration between the private sector and, and the government at, at all levels to uh, to solve some of these big issues that we're dealing with. And what's interesting to me is you're also not geographically constrained, where you're taking lessons being learned in Europe around taxonomy for ESG and bringing it back here to the U.S. and really helping to bridge, um, you know, the folks that are trying to solve this, you know, not just in their, as you said, their silos here at home, but, you know, how do we have those conversations? Here we are doing Climate Week and there's all this conversation at the U.N., you know, around solving these problems, you guys are bridging a lot of those gaps uh, yeah, in the world. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have Climate Week now. You know, in six weeks we have you know the COP, right? Yep. Uh, in 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 uh, in Ireland. So so absolutely. I, I've always been a global um, uh, 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 guy within within you know consulting businesses, and I've always I've, I've learned very early on that um, th there's good things happening everywhere, and and if you're able to take those good things to your clients wherever you are, whether you're in the Netherlands or whether you're in Brazil or whether you're here in in, in, in Florida where I am right now and bring those those lessons learned. That's 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 extra value I think that we can bring to our clients. So around you know climate and sustainability, absolutely Europe um, is leading in certain areas. Um, you know uh, yeah. uh, large scale renewables, offshore wind, hydrogen. But guess what? Um, uh, energy efficiency, the U.S. for many many years has actually been leading that space, and Europe is actually. Uh, behind and can learn a lot. So, so although Europe is building all these large scale renewables, which is which are absolutely needed, has a big opportunity on the demand side um, to really yeah. you know help decarbonize buildings and and reduce energy uses. And they can learn a lot from what we've done here in the US. So that's that's kind of how I straddle back and forth and and, and try to bring you know the best of 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 you know what was globally available to uh, to, to to my clients. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that for a second because the obviously the cultural change around climate change. Um, I actually wrote a piece uh, last year called "From Greta to the Boardroom" because there's the the, the culture dynamic around acceptance has has changed globally, and finally here in the U.S. is coming along. Uh, but we've reached a tipping point, and now we're really getting to that tipping point for business and, and finance to take actions. We're seeing ESG investment, you know, every quarter at a record level. The new administration, the Biden administration, is coming in and doing things like setting key metrics for financial institutions and public companies to measure themselves. They're looking for, you know, uh, uh, shareholders are looking for climate 
uh, planning and adaptation planning. Uh, but the reality is most companies don't have climate and sustainability as a core function area within their organizations, right? So how does GuideHouse help those firms really navigate this landscape? Yeah, the, the, the way I describe it, right, um, is if you look at, you know, uh, finance and accounting, which is a core function for, you know, every organization, right? And yeah. there's, there's governance, there's processes, there's systems, there's data, there's reporting. Um, imagine this for carbon emissions, right? So imagine a similar system within, within organizations for carbon emissions, because uh, every organization is going to set certain targets to reduce their carbon emissions over the next you know, three decades, right? Uh, we have to be carbon neutral by 2050. There's no question in my mind that that's the, that that's the bigger goal uh, at, at the end of, of, of all of this. Every, every organization, whether it's a public organization, government agency, or whether it's a, a commercial uh, organization, have to set those goals. Then they have to put a plan in place in terms of how they reduce carbon. And this is not only about energy supply. If it was energy supply, John, it would actually actually be pretty pretty easy. But this is yeah. about energy supply. This is about how we decarbonize buildings uh, that are using a lot of uh, carbon fuels. This is about transportation, and you know this is about industries and 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 agriculture. So there's some sectors that are really hard to to decarbonize. So everybody will set those targets. Everybody will have roadmaps. I think a lot of the technologies exist. Uh, it's now a matter of how do we create skill um, around some of these technologies, similar to how we create a skill around solar and onshore wind. We need to create skill around offshore wind and battery storage and 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 you know renewable gas, uh, for example, which we're going to have as well. And then and then organizations are going to need to set up again systems um, and 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 reporting structures where they can you know not only for themselves see how are we doing against those plans but also report to their shareholders and their customers um, right. uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the progress that, that, that they're making. So this is a big new area for organizations. And yes, um, I agree. I, I don't think right now that, that, that most organizations are equipped to do that. And um, uh, there's going to be a lot of resources needed, um, you know, to, to help them do with that. How we do that, um, you know, we get, we get engaged at the beginning. We get engaged at when uh, organizations want to set targets, uh, science-based targets, uh, not easy, pretty complex, um, and how you develop then roadmaps, uh, we call it decarbonization journeys, and then yeah. how do you measure the progress and how do you do reporting? Um, um, a, a, couple of, a couple of really interesting things uh, that, that we're doing now is we have, um, we are managing the partnership for carbon accounting financials, and, and financials play a big role, you know that, John, in terms of, yeah. You know, driving driving some of this um, but this 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 project that we're doing is a global partnership of financial institutions I think there's now well over 150 financial institutions that are participating in this PCAF initiative they work to, together to develop and implement a, an approach to um, uh, report and and manage uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions for all the companies that they invest in and all the companies that they own um, so you're talking about, you know, again, 150 financial institutions over 40 countries uh, representing 50 trillion in, in assets. Right. And they're all going to talk about how do we uh, report uh, and, and, and what are the, the, the measures uh, that we put in place to report on how well our you know, companies are doing against their you know, carbon emission reduction goals, um, yeah. which, which is pretty impactful work. Yeah, let me step back and, and run through that thread for a second, because so for folks that are not familiar with this and why this is so important, when we get to a place where we're really beginning to, to measure these metrics, if you think about greenhouse gas accounting and people are sort of familiar now with scope one and scope two and scope three, how is that developed? It wasn't developed in a box. There was a series of conversations and working groups that really developed these metrics that then were adopted and began to get more adopted across the market. And at some level now, you know, we're seeing out of Treasury and the SEC and out of Europe, we've had a whole conversation on the show about the taxonomy in Europe. These metrics are being now officially accepted at the government level. The work you guys are doing is building that momentum, building the cohesive uh, support of the, the folks that are going to be implementing it. But the reality is, it's still a really, um, I like to think about addressing climate a little bit as like, you remember the scene in The Matrix? You ever watched the movie The Matrix from years yes. ago? And, uh, you know, it wasn't until things really slowed down for him and he may be seeing the lines of code and right. flying by him. Right. People, climate change is scary to people, but once you start to understand it, 
and you can begin to see those lines of code. You see it runs across everything that you touch, right? Yep. And how do you address it? And what I recently read the report you guys put out, navigating the decarbonization journey, and it, it outlines for folks that are getting into the space, those different pathways and how do you get involved? So when you go into a, a company, you talk about sort of finance, supply chain, data, business model, like how do they then, you know, are they engaging you guys to help them develop their roadmaps? Uh, are, are you getting to the point now where you've got a lot of sort of off the shelf stuff you can bring in? Like what's that, what's that process like for a company engaging? Yeah, they, they engage us um, in, in, in several ways. One is indeed with setting some of these targets, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, TCFD has set some of the stages ar around, you know, a, a carbon emission uh, standards and, 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 and reporting on that. Um, but it's, 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 it's pretty complicated. Um, I, yeah, I, would, very complicated. I would argue that, that carbon accounting is actually way more complex than financial accounting. So, so imagine, right. This, right? So we're setting up systems now that are more complex than financial accounting. And financial accounting is not, not easy, and I'm not, I'm not an expert. But So it's, it's pretty complex. So, so organization engages with that. Organization engages with you know, defining the, the roadmap. We call it journey. But more and more, um, uh, we are really partnering up with companies. So, you know, in that in that same um, uh, white paper, you know, we talk about a um, a coalition that we formed with uh, with Marsh, McCormick, and Pepsi Cola, um, and it's, uh, it's it's called Supplier Leadership on Climate Transition um, uh, Collaborative. And and what we really do is what you mentioned. We we're really you know, looking at not only scope one, which is their own carbon emissions, right, of their own operations, right. Mars or McCormick or PepsiCo, but really look at scope two and three, where they're going to engage, you know, all their suppliers and, and customers to really take out carbon out of the out of the entire supply chain. So, so that's how we get more engaged as well. And then, and then last but not least, um, as you said, if you know, if, if companies don't have the expertise, um, it's really you know not easy to build it and 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 also to maintain it. Um, so. Yeah. You know, uh, we have companies now that are asking us and say, Guidehouse, can you just do it for us, right? So as organizations traditionally have outsourced some of their, you know, financial accounting, uh, uh, some of their HR processes, some of their IT processes, we're seeing the same around, you know, uh, uh, carbon accounting and, and, and reporting where we, where we basically do it for companies yeah. in models. And then we use, you know, resources from India that are, that are you know, uh, very price competitive and good, by the way, very qualified resources as well. Um, and and we, we outsource it uh, for, 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 for organizations as well. So those are some of the ways we get involved. Yeah. Do you see the, the industry maturing to where, you know, down the road, we do financial audits on all of our investments at Clean Capital and, and those re those reporting are helping to highlight what we're doing. Do you see or see a, a maturing market where, you know, 10 years from now, people are auditing their, their, uh, their sustainability and carbon metrics? They are at some level, right? And doing reports, but actually like a, a true, a true audit, like we, we, we see in the financial side. Absolutely, and I don't think it's going to take ten years, John. I think I think it will be sooner where um, uh, companies will actually certify. Um, yeah. And, and certification is not just looking at you know the numbers, but actually looking going into that production process and the logistic process and actually certify you know the levels of carbon uh, that have been taken out out of uh, you know either logistics or even production processes or, or 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 even you know some of their earlier processes in terms of you know. Uh, agriculture parts of their business well. So, so I think certification becomes key. Um, re remember Walmart said, you know, a while ago, a couple of years ago, oh, we're going we're gonna to take out a gigaton of carbon out of our uh, own operations and working with our, um, you know, our, our, our suppliers. Well, that's a big statement and very ambitious. Yeah. Love it. But, but how, do you, how do you actually measure that? And, and yeah. how do you certify that that's actually true? It will become more important, as you know. You well know. Um, uh, 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 you know, not only banks, but also insurance companies will uh, value businesses quite differently. Um, I mean, in yeah. Europe, there are already insurance companies right now that don't insure assets that are based on carbon. Um, so um, it's going to be a big uh, a thing from a from a certification. Um, accounting uh, uh, audit perspective, um, uh, because it's going to determine, you know, how many investors am I able to attract? Um, uh, what 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 uh, insurance do I pay on, on some of my assets? But in the end, it's also about their customers, right? Um, right. Uh, we've just seen that customers want this. Um, uh, people are driving a lot of this. Uh, customers want, um, you know, uh, greener solutions. 
um, uh, in, in case of, of, of some of the, the food companies, you know, in the past, um, you know, uh, some of our clients produced these big, big boxes, right? Cereal boxes. And, and, and why did they produce big boxes? Because it was all about visibility on the shelves of, of supermarkets, right? Uh, it, yeah. This is a great example. Well, when you open up a box like that, you know, you, you see a big, big plastic bag and that, and that bag is what, half full at best? Maybe yeah, right. Sometimes it's like <laughs> a third full. So it was a huge waste of, 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 of packaging, right? So, and now we've seen in Europe and, 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 you know, we have discussed with McDonald's about it and others as well in, in, in other products. Customers don't want all that, all that waste. So they, they want now smaller, you know, efficient packaging. Um, and, and guess what? It also takes up less, um, you know, space in 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 the trucks that we put in, so you save on on fuel as yeah. well. It is it's such a win 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 for everybody. Customers want it. Uh, they can reduce supply chain costs and they can reduce carbon. We have strong cases now, John, where we do all three. We we meet clients' uh, needs. We take out costs out of supply chain and we make the supply chain greener. We take out carbon, and that's a win win for everybody because shareholders love yeah. that. Clients want that. And the, and the CFO likes it as well because they're saving costs at the same time. Yeah, th that's why I think we're at a tipping point, right? The demand is now here where it's it's no longer a, just a CEO who's driven by this, but it's 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 a requirement. It's going to be driving a lot of a lot of the, lot of the change across the company. So I do want to just a change for a second. I think you know my background, and you know I led led. Uh, sustainability for the federal government, did a lot of climate planning for the federal government. And at one point, the federal government was a real leader in this space, driving large scale renewables, looking at supply chain, you know, looking at um, everything about, you know, electronics and, and driving uh, um, sustainability and electronics. They've sort of lost that mantle the last few years and are trying to, you know, restart and regain momentum here. You know, what I, I, I find really interesting is that the, the work that you're doing with the private sector, who now is really leading leading this, how do we take those lessons learned and bring them back to the, the federal community so that they can be leaders once again in this space, whether it be the Defense Department or, you know, the, the work that's happening across, you know, the GSA or Department of, of, of Energy, you know, how can you guys help them uh, guide their way forward? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today with solar if it wasn't for the U.S. government, you know, starting some of uh, those, those, you know, scaling some of those technologies early on. Um, same with microgrids, by the way. Um, so there are there are a couple of examples there. Same with energy efficiency standards, right, of appliances in, in, in buildings and, and office buildings and, and in our homes as well. Um, uh, you know, a lot of that work has been has been led by the Department of Energy for, for decades. And again, I think I think you is still a leader in terms of you know energy efficiency of appliance and and, and buildings uh, things like that. So absolutely, U.S. Um, uh, was a leader and and in certain areas is still a leader. But but Europe uh, and, and other regions obviously um, are, are are making big investments and 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 getting ahead of us as well. Um, how it's it, for me it's simple and and as you know we have a big team uh, working with all the departments that that you mentioned um, and 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 you know our footprint of of guidehouse half of our business or more than half of our business is with with government federal government and state and local. Um, I, I think right now with with the the, the the direction of you know the new administration um, uh, the, the 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 targets are coming down on 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 you know the agencies and the departments. Um, uh, we have a really, really uh, 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 interesting opportunity right now. Um, take, for example, Department of Defense. Um, Department of Defense um, is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, utility in the world, um, given all the utility assets that they have, right? They have substations, right. they have transmission, distribution, they have behind the meter, microgrid, they have storage, they have all of that. They also own one of the biggest uh, fleets in the world, uh, vehicles, and 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 both, let's say, you know, commercial vehicles, and then you have, you know, all the all the combat and army vehicles, and 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 you have the planes and all that stuff. So there's there's two parts of it. I, I get it. Um, and and then they have a lot of you know locations and a lot of buildings and a lot of bases um, uh, that, that, that 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 we're talking about here. So so yeah, just to give you some color, that the army has three times the square footage of Walmart. Yeah. Right. Just the army alone. That doesn't count the other yeah. agencies. So here you go. Now, the flip side is they're also the biggest emitter in the U.S., right? They're responsible totally. for almost 1% of carbon emissions in the U.S. So right there, you have the biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in, in the U.S. So if you want to have an impact, you know, uh, I, th I think it, it can be used. And, and then if you if you look 
at the, their ecosystem where they work with large corporations uh, and, and companies, you know, consulting companies like us, Guidehouse, but also manufacturers in this space, right, that are ma manufacturing equipment uh, for energy uh, supply, um, uh, that are manufacturing, you know, vehicles and things like that. They have a huge opportunity to work together with us and, 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 and their commercial partners to really make a dent and, and really drive some of these technologies at scale. And whether that's, you know, electric vehicles or whether that's uh, building electrification or whether that is, you know, uh, uh, large scale um, uh, battery storage uh, that, they, that they need, they have a unique opportunity, not, not only to reduce their carbon emissions footprint and make them more resilient, um, but actually to drive the US and the global agenda forward. So, so we've, we've been talking uh, 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 to them and, and, and you know, I, I, think, I think they understand the role that they could play and it could be way more impactful than, than what we've seen so far. Uh, specifically right, I agree. The US, and, and we're ex super excited about it. Excellent. Well, you know, I, I, first of all, for, for folks that are, are just learning about Guidehouse now, you can go to guidehouse.com and you can access uh, the Navigating the carbon Decarbonization Journey uh, right there on the home homepage with a bunch of other really great thought leadership pieces and, and, uh, um, uh, and, and great data around where the industry is going. Um, Jan, I always ask my, my, uh, my folks on the, the podcast the same, same final question. If you can go back and sit down with yourself and in the Netherlands and, and give yourself a piece of advice before you headed off to work at KPMG at the time, what, what piece of advice would you give yourself? Yeah, it's an interesting question. There's just so many pieces of advice, but, but I think one is, um, um, you know, think outside your lane, uh, think outside your box. Um, it is very human um, uh, to think about, you know, your own lane. Uh, we're not going to solve uh, some of these problems um, if, if, if we stick to our own lane. So, so yeah. um, uh, really uh, 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 think big um, and, and, and really see how you can collaborate to solve some of these problems is, is really important. important. Uh, th this is very interesting. When I talk about some of these bigger issues and how we should attack them, people get worried about, about their own box. And, 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 and I'm like, don't worry about your own box. Th this is what we're trying to solve here. And, and we need you know, all the stakeholders engaged. And we need to look at all the technology that are available, right? It's not one technology. There's no silver bullet to solve this problem. So we need, we need all the stakeholders. We need all the technologies. And then we need all the financing, both, you know, that, that comes available through, you know, uh, governments um, and uh, as well as, you know, some of the private funding. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to combine those two and a lot of interest to combine those two. You know that better than I do. Yeah. We need all of that. Uh, and, and, and it's all about skill right now. Um, um, but we need to hurry, right? Right now we're on we a need path. To hurry. We're, we're on a path of three degrees uh, and, and we need to get to one and a half degree. That's a big, a, a big, a big, a big uh, uh, uphill battle there that we need to, uh, need to uh, have, but, but I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very optimistic. I think that the technologies are here. The will is here. Uh, now we just need to make it happen. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And, and thank you for the leadership you and Guidehouse are showing in this and helping to really uh, take people on what you call the journey here. Uh, we, we need to be driving forward. So thank you so much for joining us at Experts Only. Thanks, John. It was uh, my pleasure, man. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for the team at Guidehouse and uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Keneally. Uh, make sure I said that right after I talked to her. And uh, Ted Adair and the folks at Guidehouse for putting this together. And for, um, as always, our, our producers, uh, Colin Young and Carly Batten. You can get more episodes at cleancapital.com. We'll also have a link to the Guidehouse uh, reports there. Uh, you know, really look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks. <laughs>